Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the April 6th meeting of the Harbordale Civic Association. Thank you all for coming tonight. We have a lot of people on the line tonight. I think that's a testament to our, um, our guest, Alan Cohen from uh, Broward County, who's going to be talking to us about the uh, Convention Center project. And um, I was going to share my, my screen, and I'm going to uh, put up the agenda. And the agenda is over here. Well, I can't make that move, can I? Yes, I can. Here's the agenda. Can everybody see the agenda once it comes up? It's coming up. Wait, wait. Why won't you come up? Oh, well, this is not good. Oh, there it is. Okay, here's our agenda for this evening. Um, I want to point out that if anybody is interested in seeing the minutes of the previous meeting, you know, you can always go. I always give you a link and it takes you to our YouTube channel where you can see all the minutes of uh, all the recordings of our meetings. Um, and that's uh, the link is there for you if you missed the last meeting or you want to check it out. Um, tonight, our guest is Alan Cohen. And um, without further ado, since Alan is here, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to let Alan introduce himself and uh, begin to talk about our annual update on the Convention Center project. Alan, you are our guest and you are on. Thank you very much, Marilyn, and good evening, everyone. Um, uh, for those of you who um, do not know me, uh, I'm one of the assistant county administrators and the project lead for um, a, a couple of different projects, one of them being the Convention Center Expansion and Headquarters Hotel Project. Uh, it's been my pleasure over the years to uh, present to this group. Uh, I used to do so in person. Sometimes those meetings got a little raucous, but they were fun. And um, uh, I'm, I'm here essentially just to give you an update. I don't have much... <laughs> of a presentation per se. Um, uh, I, I have Marilyn one slide to share at the appropriate time when we get to it. Okay. Uh, but other than that, I'll just give you an update on where the project is. Uh, and um, before I do that, I'm going to start with the bypass road because I know that's paramount so, in, in some people's minds. Bypass uh, road. So. Marilyn, there's a lot of background noise. I'm here. gonna, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna be muting. Yes. Okay. Continue. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the bypass road, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with that initiative, uh, going back uh, many, many years, Port Everglades used to be an open facility. Folks from the south could cut through it to get to the beach. In short. Uh, that uh, changed after 9-11. The port became a secure facility and all traffic from the south um, continued up Federal Highway to 17th Street and then down 17th, down 17th to the beach. So that uh, at, the, at the time added a significant traffic load. That continues to be the case. Uh, the city uh, was interested in alleviating that situation and in our discussions with them several years ago as part of this project we agreed to build a bypass road. That bypass road would siphon traffic off of Federal Highway at the intersection of State Road 84 on the west and uh, 24th Street slash Spangler Drive on the right. Traffic would turn right onto 24 Spangler, go all the way to Eisenhower, make a left, and then take Eisenhower up to 17th Street. And, um, or they, they might take it up to the convention center and go in, or they would continue going up to 17th Street uh, and then make a right to go to the beach. Uh, so uh, that's been uh, the route now for a few years. Uh, we are formally in the design process that started uh, last fall in earnest. Uh, we are 
uh, receiving state funds for uh, a good part of this project. Uh, the first tranche of state funds came in last July, but it took a couple of months or more to, uh, once you're notified of the funds then you have to sign agreements and everything else with the state. Uh, and so, and then you go out for your RFP for your design professionals. We did all that. And the uh, and please don't ask me who the design team is because I can't remember right now. Of course, I'm having a senior moment. But um, the design firm is working on the uh, the uh, the concept. Uh, the route has not changed, nor will the route change. How we navigate within the boundaries of Port Everglades is what has been changing. Uh, because of unknown infrastructure. Uh, as we navigate through and uh, we realize, and we've known this for a long time actually, that most of the plans for Port Everglades are not up to date and don't reflect everything that's underground. So we have to investigate and try and find out what's under there. And as we do, and one of the things we found that we weren't clearly aware of was a 60 inch stormwater uh, pipe, which sat in a very inopportune place. And um, it wasn't on any drawings, but it's clearly there and operational. And um, we, could, we couldn't build on top of it. So we had to change, that's one example of what happened. Um, so the, the route will be mostly at surface level. It's going to go up and over at least one part of um, 24 Spangler uh, so that we're able to maintain the traffic patterns within Port Everglades. Uh, and we're also, um, and this route that I'm talking about will be a completely secure route. So once you enter the bypass road, you're not gonna be able to turn off of it to anywhere in Fort Everglades. You'll be forced to continue around that turn I told you about from either direction and then end up at the other end of the road. And when I say the other end of the road, that would be just short of Federal Highway and just short of the convention center on the north. Um, and, and I'll explain that in, in a moment. So um, we are, on schedule to finalize design um, in, I believe, early, early 23. We have um, a tranche of funding for the construction coming in July of 23. And depending on how things are uh, scheduled, uh, we're hoping that uh, we will uh, start construction at the end of 23, if not uh, the very beginning of 24, with a timeline to finish it in time uh, for the fall of 25 opening of the hotel, which was a, um, a requirement of the city that um, the bypass road be substantially complete or substantially in progress before the hotel would get its CO. A certificate of occupancy. Um, so the the actual um, the bypass road officially starts at 20th Street when you're heading from let's say you're heading from the beach and you make a left onto Eisenhower. That first stretch of road is technically not part of the bypass road because the bypass road is this unique corridor going through the port but it's obviously part of the connection to it. Um, so um, at right after the intersection of 20th Street, uh, that, then there will be this entrance before the port security uh, gate there into the road, and then you'll be able to go seamlessly to uh, the other end of State Road 84. We are going to start work on the north end. This is between 17th and 20th Street. Um, sometime we hope the by the end of this year to start our work widening the north end of eisenhower boulevard so eisenhower boulevard on the northbound side will receive a 
full new lane between 20th Street and 17th Street. On the uh, southbound side, there will be a new lane, but not going the, that entire length because in particular, the, the city's wastewater treatment plant is too close to the right of way for us to be able to carve out another lane in front of it. Um, and so right after that uh, property, that's when we're going to expand and ex add an extra lane, um, which is pretty good timing because it will facilitate folks either getting into the bypass lane, going straight to go into Port Everglades, or getting into an extended left-hand turn lane, which uh, will be exclusively serving the convention center in terminals two and four. Um, so that's sort of a, an update on that. And Marilyn, I realized before I go on and talk about the other project aspects, do you want me to take questions on the bypass road? I'm just gonna ask people who have questions to please go down to reactions and raise their hands. And I'm going to start with uh, Melissa Rodriguez. And uh, the reason I'm asking you to raise your hands, everybody, is because I've muted everybody in order to stop the feedback. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and I will, I will recognize you. So Melissa. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much um, for that overview. I just wondered in terms of the design, is there a plan for public participation um, in terms of any workshops or charrettes? And if so, where's the best place for us to get information on those meetings? At the moment, I am unaware of uh, any such opportunity. Uh, the, uh, this is, um, that, that's a great question and I need to talk to staff about um, that, staff from our highway construction and engineering division about whether or not that's something that's in the process. So I'm gonna to have to circle back with you on that. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I just, you know, there are issues of walkability here in this area, you know, in particular off of Miami Road and, um, and you know, 17th and 18th. And, and I'm sure you're, you're aware of that. Um, you've toured the site, I'm sure, and, and looked at the plans. So I just, I, just uh, I think there's a real opportunity here um, in terms of providing some some input on design, and, and I hope that's that's under consideration uh, for the county and the city. Well, um, M Melissa, um, like I said, I'll circle back and, and let you know uh, what, if anything, we have lined up for that. But I wanna be clear on one thing, uh, that's the overriding concern on the design. Because um, we've had different community stakeholders express specific design-related concerns about the project. The overriding concern of this project, aside from creating a bypass road, is Port Everglades security. Because the bypass road runs through the, you know, a secure area. Um, so we're, um, we, we will have to ultimately get sign off from uh, Homeland Security, I think through the Coast Guard, which is the lead agency down here uh, for the port. Um, we are not doing anything to encourage walking on the bypass road, for example, um, because the port does not want people out of their cars walking along and then potentially scaling a fence to get into the secure port area. So the, there, these are very unusual considerations. Um, I had to deal with them, for example, in the design of the hotel uh, for the convention center project. We have no balconies facing either the cruise ships or the gas tanks because of very specific security concerns that the port had uh, about public access to be able to somehow interfere with those particular areas of the port. Um, so I'm just letting you know uh, that that consideration is the driving force behind most of the design. Uh, and um, I will again circle back with uh, the group uh, through Marilyn uh, to let you know if there are any opportunities for public input on the design. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
Um, Melissa, let me just add to that, that later in the, uh, in the meeting, we'll be talking about the Southeast 17th Street walking audit, which we're working on with the city Department of Transportation to talk about extending the bike lanes and uh, crosswalks along 17th Street. So um, just keep that in mind when we go forward. If that's something that's of uh, interest to you, you might want to be participating in that because that will bring some um, real physical benefits to the uh, community uh, along 17th Street. So I'm asking uh, anybody uh, have any other questions they want to ask about the bypass road. There are other issues as well. Steve, did you, uh, Alan, did you want to show a, you said you had a particular slide. Is, is it about the it's, bypass It's not road? for this. It, it's, okay. you, you would ask me to talk about the public plaza. Yes, well, let me, before you get on to that, um, in your invitation to this meeting, there was an article from the Sun Sentinel from 2017 that showed the, uh, um, the preliminary design of the bypass road. So if there haven't, hasn't been major changes to that alignment, you might wanna go back to your invitation and click on that Sun Sentinel article to see the uh, alignment uh, from 20, 2019 for those who are interested. Okay, yeah, 2019, uh, so yes. 2019, yes. So um, uh, why don't we go on to the uh, convention center hotel itself? Okay, so um, <clears throat> so the, the project was uh, organized in different phases. Uh, the first phase is uh, more than one related to the expansion of the existing structure, um, specifically to um, create more contiguous exhibition hall space. Uh, so we added uh, to our already existing 200,000 square feet in an, an additional 150,000 square feet. We also um, constructed the building in such a way that both the foundation and the roof structure is designed to accommodate a second floor in the future if the county determines that they need more exhibition space. Um, the, the sweet spot in the trade show industry is typically 450 to 500,000 square feet of exhibition space. Uh, and we, we're now at 350 thousand square feet. So we're much better than where we were before, and we're going to see how far uh, that takes us. Um, so all the, all the, um, there, there, as you know, the front end of the convention center was lopped off that, that had some offices in it and, and a couple of meeting rooms and the central energy plant. We rebuilt that on the south end of the facility. So, um, you know, you're not looking at cooling towers anymore um, or um, uh, can you hold on one second? Sure. I'm so sorry. Oh God, this is the beautiful, the beauty of Zoom. <laughs> Usually you get to see the, their pet dog or cat running, running through the building, r running through the frame. Okay, we'll just wait for Alan to come back. Okay, so it's just a few sides. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I might be done by the time you're so. All right. Sorry. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Look, so, at this, look um, at it this way, Alan. It's better than having to drive out to a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so anyhow, the central energy plan, as I say, got rebuilt in the back. So you're not looking at cooling towers anymore. And you're not looking at the kind of infrastructure related to um, heating, plumbing, air conditioning, and, and the like, um, that's all um, now away from uh, the street. Uh, in its place is where the hotel is gonna go. And you saw, um, for those of you living in the Port Condo, I'm sure you saw the installation of the um, foundation piles going in. We specifically did that using what's called an auger method where you drill in and then um, um, inject the concrete um, as opposed to banging them in. Um, we, we wanted to limit both the noise and the vibration impacts. Um, currently, there are some sheet piles that are going in. Those were unavoidable. Those are much smaller 
uh, a, a foundation pile could be 30, 40, 50, even 60 feet long. Uh, these sheet piles are, I don't know, 15, 20 feet long. Uh, they're very thin and, and they go in pretty quickly. Um, so uh, less noise and less vibration than you would find for these other piles. And, and because of the type of soils that we have, this is the only way for us to reasonably get these types of piles in. And um, as you know, we sent a notification to you about this last week uh, with a picture. And, and I believe that was Marilyn distributed to yes. everyone. Okay, yes, Carlos great. distributed to everyone, yeah. Okay, super. So um, uh, we're about to start the vertical construction on the hotel. Um, we have issued a notice to proceed for that first stage of work uh, based on some monies that we had already uh, um, in our accounts. Uh, we just sold bonds for the remaining of the project, uh, for, the, for the remainder of the project, excuse me. We're actually closing on those bonds, I believe on the 18th of this month. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, the project will move forward. Um, the hotel build is expected to take three and a half years. Um, right, so uh, not all of that is gonna be exterior. At, at some point will be dried in, so to speak, like we were with the convention center. And then a ton more activity will be happening inside of the structure. Uh, and there's a lot of fitting and furnishing um, that, that, that happens before you can even move furniture and, and equipment in uh, to a building like this. Uh, as you can imagine, 800 rooms, that's 800 bathrooms uh, with all the requisite plumbing to go through the entire building. Um, 800 different sets of uh, electrical outlets and everything else and, you know, intercoms or security systems or, or whatever else is, is going to go in there. Uh, so um, we're expecting the hotel to open in um, uh, late fall of 25, uh, the October timeframe. And um, uh, around that same time, if not a few months sooner, uh, we also expect to be opening up uh, what we call the East Expansion. The East Expansion is a standalone building of the Convention Center. And um, it's going to be built where the, um, where the old Sailfish Fountain used to be and the north end of the Northport parking garage. So that will, there's a road that runs right in front of the Convention Center, immediately on the other side of that road, uh, will be that building and that will go um, up to about 75 feet um, to the water. Uh, the last 75 feet is still um, secure dockage for Port Everglades. Uh, so that will be running uh, behind the building. That new building will have a new grand ball uh, or new ballroom in it, which will be twice the size of uh, the one that we currently have in the facility. Uh, we're going to be, I think, close to tripling the number of meeting rooms that we have. Uh, we're going to have a new master kitchen there, um, which will serve the entire facility with a new commissary and whatnot, um, with um, special connections between the two buildings to facilitate uh, the delivery uh, of those uh, food and equipment uh, during uh, events and, and the like. Um, so that that building is approximately 400,000 square feet. Uh, the uh, expanding convention center now is approximately 800,000 square feet. Um, so we'll, we'll, we were at 600,000, we're gonna end up at uh, 1.2 million, um, maybe about 50 feet shy, 50 square feet shy of that. So in essence, 1.2 square, uh, 1.2 million square feet. Um, and what else can I tell you? So there are two other things that are going to go on. I'll tell you about one, and I think I'll separate Madeline the Plaza from the rest of this so we can ask about the buildings and then we can talk about the plaza separately. We're also building a new headquarters for our convention and visitors bureau, uh, visit, Flor visit Lauderdale, excuse me. That is gonna be located on the corner 
of Eisenhower and 17th Street. Uh, it's going to be a small three-story building that's L-shaped, uh, you know, hugging the corner. Um, so it will, as you're coming from the west down 17th Street, you'll the, the hotel will be, you know, of course above it, but that little building will shield um, uh, the front entrance until you get by it, and then um, you'll see the rest of the hotel as you're uh, traveling by it. Um, the CVB is currently located near the federal courthouse downtown in rented space. Uh, this will be an opportunity for the CVB to have their own facility right uh, at the doorstep of its most important asset, the convention center, which the CVB manages. Uh, and um, the CVB will not be overseeing the hotel itself, but it will be managing what's called a room block agreement between the hotel and um, uh, the, the convention center to facilitate um, uh, providing enough rooms for groups that wanna come in uh, for various meetings and whatnot. Uh, all of these changes were driven, and I've talked about this years ago, but it bears repeating because I think we have some new people, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. All of these changes um, were catalyzed by programming sessions that we held um, with a variety of different stakeholders. Uh, and we had neighborhood folks talk to us as well. Uh, but in particular, we met with um, numerous representatives from the meetings industry. Uh, we met with meeting planners. We met with event organizers. We met with um, uh, presidents of organizations. And we um, specifically had those meetings to, to reinforce or um, to validate what we had already uh, collected in our market intelligence about why people weren't coming, which was no on-site hotel, ballrooms not large enough, not enough meeting rooms, exhibition hall is not large enough. Uh, so those were the driving factors. And um, uh, what we are um, building uh, is in response to industry needs and will better position us to attract more trade shows and professional uh, organization meetings. The reason why I'm belaboring this point and you know, uh, highlighting it is because we hope to bring in more of that type of business at the expense of consumer trade shows or consumer shows. So um, consumer shows, are, which are essentially like, they're called business to consumer, B2C, uh, as opposed to a trade show, which is B2B, business to business. Um, consumer shows rely on a regional population to support them. So folks that live in that community and folks that are traveling from the surrounding region to the community. Those are the shows that generate uh, what I endearingly call uh, the, the road network constipation that we sometimes see uh, when we have certain types of events at the convention center. When we have these large citywide events, uh, let's say the American Dental Association rents out the entire facility and whatnot. Those people are flying in from all over the country and they're staying at numerous other hotels. Uh, we arrange to shuttle them from all the different hotels to the convention center. You're not seeing uh, a huge number of vehicles converging on the convention center all at the same day at the same time or, or within the same time range. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things we heard loud and clear from you all is that traffic was a concern and it's, it's counterintuitive to some, but the expansion will actually result in less traffic problems as we reduce the number of consumer shows that we have. Um, so uh, I'll end on that note for this part of our discussion, uh, see what questions we might have on those buildings or process. And then the last thing uh, that I'll talk about is the public plaza that we're gonna be developing um, in front of the hotel and convention center. 
<laughs> okay, thank you, Alan. That was very comprehensive. Uh, again, I'm gonna give everybody the opportunity to go down to the reaction button and raise your hand. If you have any questions about the hotel, the timing of the hotel, the, the use of the hotel, anything about the, um, the, uh, the hotel and expansion portion of the project. I'm gonna give everybody a couple of minutes to decide whether or not they wanna raise their hand. And while you're deciding whether you want to raise your hand, I have a, a, just a, a question, Alan. After this is all completed, what rank or in the, in the East Coast or even in the, in the United States Convention Center world, are we going to be uh, the number one, the number two, the number five uh, convention center in terms of ability to host these events? Um, do you have any idea about that? Are we gonna? Uh, I, I do, there? and and I, I do, and and Marilyn, it's far from that. There are we we are migrating from um, what is known in the industry as a tier three facility to a tier two facility. Okay. Tier one facilities have a million square feet or more of exhibition space. Um, at the most based on what we've provided for uh, vertical expansion for a second floor, we're, we're not gonna get past 500,000 square feet. Uh, so we're, we're never gonna get into the tier one. The tier one, for those of you who travel and have seen them, you're talking about places like Jacob Javits in New York, the Orlando Convention Center, uh, McCormick Center in Chicago. Um, I think Nashville has a, a large facility um uh the moscone center in san francisco these are all they're huge facilities we don't have enough property to ever reach uh that um that that level that size um so we will when everything is in place be um a tier uh two facility and just barely because tier two facilities start, they, they, they range between 350,000 square feet to a million square feet, or just under a million. Okay. Well, I, I asked the question because um, I think it's important for people to, to appreciate the um, economic impact of the convention center on Broward County and on our tax base. You know, bringing the convention center out of tier one and into tier two uh, will, um, make it possible for us to generate a great deal more economic development and a great deal more taxes for Broward County. Have you got any handle on how much more valuable this facility will be to the county's treasury? Um, yes, and, and I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking on my computer right now to see if I can find, um, up. This might be it right here. Hold on. Okay, so the um, give me a second. Hmm. Okay, I okay. I thought I had the old numbers in there too. Apparently, I don't. But I can share with you the new numbers. So um, the uh, the, as a result of all this expansion, economic activity in Broward County will increase, um, uh, is projected to increase $211 million a year. Um, that's primarily driven by hotel rooms, restaurant, stay, uh, restaurant visitations, and retail visitations with some local tourist attractions as well. We expect an increase in permanent employment of 1,330 jobs. Uh, the increase in taxes on the local level is not that much. We expect bed tax to go up by uh, somewhere between a million and two million, but a lot of the tax benefits are actually gonna go to the state of Florida um, because um, they, they keep about 92% of sales tax that's collected locally. Um, a lot that's of folks aren't, yeah, a lot of folks aren't aware of that, but that happens to be one of the reasons why we live in a state without a personal income tax. 
uh, that's how they're that's how they're able to fund state government uh, in, in, instead. Well, so, that's, a, that's uh, a good thing to know, Alan, because nobody wants an income tax. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I wish I, I, I think that the current level of activity I, I, you know, I, I don't want to guess, and I know I had those numbers here, and they're in a report. I can get back to you on it, but um, but it's, these it's numbers safe. we we didn't do. I, I just want to say we didn't develop the numbers that I just shared with you. We hired HVS, which is a national hospitality consultancy uh, based in Chicago. They came down and have done uh, a market study for the hotel and an economic impact study on the whole project. And that study has been twice updated. The numbers that I just read to you came from the most recent update of the study. Um, so it's it's not anything that we're making up. It's what the experts are, are telling us based on their, um, what they like to believe is their conservative projections on the impacts. Okay. Uh, did I answer your question, Marilyn? Yeah, yes, you did. And I, I hope everybody takes, uh, takes note of that, that all of this, grief and aggravation we may be going through in the short term, in the long term will pay off for, uh, for all of us in the, um, in the city and the county and the state. So since I don't see anybody with their hands up uh, asking questions up to this point. No, no, hold it, Marilyn. Well, yes. I, I see three people with Oh, wait, wait, up. wait, I'm moving I over. I see the, the Canes, Mr. Weber and Ms. McGill all have their hands up. How come I don't see that? Oh, yes. OK, Robert, we'll start with you. Asked to unmute. You're unmuted, Hello. Robert. Yes. Hello. And, and, and actually, before, before Robert starts, I, I just want to um, say something and make an acknowledgment. Um, the, the, the importance of these, these opportunities to communicate um, uh, are important. And it's a two-way communication. So uh, I'm just not here to share information with you, but to gather it. And what's been beneficial about this is that um, folks in the community have felt very comfortable reaching out to me to share concerns that they have or just information. And I wanted to acknowledge just recently, Robert reaching out to me uh, regarding a community meeting that was held with Mancini and Sons about a uh, water main replacement on your street, uh, which we had no idea about until Robert brought it to my attention. And um, Mancini had also made some interesting assumptions about <laughs> the convention center site and its accessibility based on Google Maps from God knows when, but they, they don't reflect um, the reality on the ground. But Robert, I wanted to take the opportunity to once again say thank you uh, for sharing that information, for reaching out. And, and I'm sharing this in front of everyone else as well to highlight the importance of reaching out if you have um, information, questions, or concerns. Okay, uh, I'm sorry to embarrass you. Uh, both of uh, the Canes have been wonderful, um, um, even Michelle. Uh, so <laughs> she's laughing, she knows yeah. why. <laughs> but um, I, I do appreciate the dialogue. So let me turn it back over to you guys. Uh, Michelle's gonna uh, has a question for you. Uh, okay. Nice to see you, Alan. Thank you. I appreciate you being here this evening. And I do appreciate the fact that you've always been very uh, prompt and helpful and getting back when you didn't have the information right at hand. So thank you for that. It's, it's been, like you said, a two-way street and I appreciate that. I did have a couple of concerns and I just want to raise them because it has to do with construction. Now that we know the timetable more or less regarding the hotel construction and what the next phases are and when they're going to be occurring. Uh, one of the things, and I did bring it to your attention, I believe last week was the blowing dirt. Of course, we did have that issue about a year or so ago, it was resolved, but now here we are again. And since construction's ongoing, I would like to know how long you believe that the piles of dirt that we're seeing now that are blowing everywhere will remain on site. Um, and, and my concern obviously is if it's temporary until these pilings or whatever are put in and then they'll be flattened once again, fine. But if this is gonna be ongoing over the next two or three years, I think we need to address how we're gonna deal with the constant dirt debris that's coming all over our property. And so I, I would appreciate your input on that. 
Okay, so um, um, I, I guess I need to ask you a question first. When you say um, piles, do you mean the elevated dirt mounds that we have? Yeah, that are blowing, okay. yes. Okay, so um, I, I guess the good news is those are gonna be, or at least a good portion of those are gonna be covered up in the not too distant future. Um, those piles are there as they are because we're building the two new buildings at, at a at a elevation that's four feet higher than uh, the rest of the site. Um, so the, um, the buildings will be going on top of that. And so um, once the pile caps go in uh, and, and whatever the, the cross braces are called, the next step is to actually pour the slab. And so the slab will cover the entire area where the hotel is gonna be. I'll talk to the staff about for the remaining area that's going to be the the roadway in front of the hotel um I, I i know that we've increased watering but maybe we can put down some sort of netting or something else once we're in a better position uh and and um we're we're done with utility relocation uh and the like which is some of what is going on now in addition to the um the the sheet pile driving so those two yeah, do you know right now, if we're looking at a month, six months, a year, I mean, is there any... I, 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 I can't answer that off the top of my head, okay. but that's something I can circle back with. Marilyn, can you do me a favor? Because sure. I, I, I don't have a pen and paper with me. I've reached my point of saturation. I've got on, it. I'll make a list. On, on remembering what I'm supposed to come back to you with, okay? So, you can right. trust so, me to remember. And yes. can I ask one more question as a yes. follow on oh, to that so as well? I believe at the last Harbordale meeting where you appeared, and I can't remember exactly when that was, forgive me, but I did raise the issue to you that I know that you were granted a waiver to start construction at 7 a.m. because at the time the commission believed that we needed to get things done for the boat show. And there was a rush to get everything done. Now that we're looking at a three and a half year construction period for the hotel, how, I asked you to get back to me and about whether or not you need still need that waiver or if you'll go back to the original 8 a.m. start and the original uh, end time, I think, of 8 p.m. Because, as you know, with ongoing construction, it start with the, the trucks, they don't start at 7. We know they don't. They prep. And they're on that site at 5 a.m. And sometimes they're doing prep at 5.30, quarter to 6. i am got, gotten used to it but I can't envision doing this for another three years. Well, so how do you, what is the, the idea? Are you going to go back to the regular time or are you gonna insist upon an ongoing 7 a.m. waiver? Because I, I don't see the immediacy of doing this for the next three and a half years. Okay, so Michelle, the very first thing I'm gonna tell you is that if there are trucks and activity on that site earlier than seven, call the police. Okay, I'm telling you, okay, because they're not supposed to be on there. Um, and, uh, and we have told them that um, sometimes subs will come onto a site um, without the knowledge of the contractor. I, 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 I'm I not saying- How would they get on though? It's locked. The gate's supposed to be locked. No, no, because they, they have access. So oh, okay. I'm not saying that that's the case here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we, we have made a commitment to you mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I, I've spoken with the contractor about this before. Um, if they're unable to control that, um, you know, by all means, uh, take what, what steps that, that you feel is necessary. Um, I have colleagues who might not agree with me on that, mm -hmm. um, but it's clearly the right thing to do. And regarding now, the waiver? Regarding the waiver, I did bring that up. I did not get a definitive answer from them. Um, so- Can uh, we do that again since it's been six months since I raised it? Yes, uh, I will. You. Marilyn's adding that to my list. Thank you, appreciate uh, that. Alan. And um, I well, will talk Well, actually, Alan, your waiver had a time limitation on it. Yes. Yeah, and, and so, I'm thinking that, so right. I, I, 
Yeah, I think that they've been violating the time. Nobody's gone back to the commission with justification as to why it should be continuing. And I think that probably it did expired and they're still on that site earlier than they should be. Okay, so I, I got that on the list. I got that on the list you, that Marilyn. we're going back. And thank you, it. Alan, I appreciate it. Thanks, Marilyn. Okay. And, and um, Michelle, I'm, I, know, I know that, I'm gonna make this one statement. I know the contractor is acutely aware of the legal construction hours. Um, so I, I, I need to, I was seeing if I could look it up over here while I was talking to you. Okay. Um, but um, he, they, he should be abiding by that. And, um, you know, I'll- Well, again, you guys I'll, do have a, ca you do have a camera on the roof. <laughs> yes, we do. So you know, which, which that's a good by way the way, to see if they're abiding by the law. Okay, and which, by the way, is also public record. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I okay. appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, that was Robert and Michelle. Uh, Steve Weber, you're unmuted. Steve. Uh, yes. Wait, Marilyn. Before oh, we I'm go sorry. to the next yes. thing, I, I do want to. There's one caveat to everything that I just said before Mr. Weber speaks uh, for Michelle and Robert and everybody else. There are going to be isolated incidents, particularly with concrete pours, where we are going to be on the site earlier. Um, uh, the nature of a concrete pour is that you have to bring all the material in fairly quickly, and that's not always possible during the day because of uh, per, you know prevailing traffic conditions. So they typically do these pours in the overnight hours. Um, we've let you know about this in the past. Um, I believe we'll continue to do that, but I, I, I just wanted to make sure I reiterated that, that, you know, that there will be exceptions to what we just talked about. Okay. Okay. Steve Weber. Yes. Hi, Alan. Thank you very much for being here. You've been quite informative. Uh, you, you, you said the, uh, I guess the, the pad where the uh, hotel is going to be is now at an elevation four feet higher than the rest of the site. Uh, is that four feet higher than where the plaza is going to be that you're going to talk about? It is not four feet higher than the plaza. We're also raising the elevation of the plaza. Okay. The other is a curiosity question. But, but not, not four feet. Uh, okay. The plaza is, I think, going up two or two and a half feet. Okay. And the second part is a curiosity question. Why is it being raised? That it's, be, it's being raised because one of the things that we're, we're very committed to not only sustainability, but resiliency. Um, so the, the structures that we're building are gonna be at a minimum leak gold, um, but we also want to make sure that what we were building would last into the future under a variety of different conditions. Okay. So the, the, the site itself is between, depending on where the site you're on, between five to seven feet above median sea level. All right. So um, sea level rise in and of itself for this site is really not that much of a concern. What is a concern is a potential storm surge. And we commissioned as part of our planning a wave study looking at potential wave activity on the site uh, under the condition of a direct hit hurricane uh, bearing down on Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and, and you want to look at these types of worst case scenarios to determine what type of inundation the site would experience. And one of the reasons the plaza was, is being raised is to absorb the energy and block a good amount of wave activity because it was um, potentially, it could go up another uh, two, two and a half feet higher than uh, the level that it's at right now. Um, and not wanting to take any chances, we added additional feet or a foot and a half, two feet to the buildings themselves uh, so that if there was any overtopping and waves came onto the site, they wouldn't, they wouldn't come up to uh, the lobbies of these uh, new buildings that we're building. So we're very specifically doing it to uh, avoid that particular scenario. Now the existing convention center, uh, to anticipate the question, is built at the current level of seven feet above sea level, not the 11 feet that we're going for the other buildings. 
Um, what we did with that is we went through and replaced a lot of materials in there, particularly sheetrock with more resilient wall coverings that can get wet and dry out quickly without um, mold issues. Um, so, and we've uh, moved and will continue. There's one particular closet that we still need to attend to be moving electrical infrastructure higher uh, in the existing facility. The new energy plant that I told you about is actually built over 20 feet above uh, surface level. Um, and the new FPL vault that they put in uh, was also built at a um, slightly higher level above um, the ground uh, so that the vault itself wouldn't flood out. Um, so uh, there, you know, we couldn't address everything the way we would have liked had we done everything in a new build, uh, but, um, you know, we're doing the best that we can. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, and the next person would be Barbara McGill. Barbara. Hi, hi, Alan. Seems like it's been a couple of years since I've seen you. Um, since you mentioned about some changes with the bypass road that were unforeseen, I'm wondering, is there anything at the hotel um, that's changed since we kind of had our meetings and approved kind of plans? Um, I know we were concerned with noise you know, having outdoor events up high and stuff like that. Has any event, you know, have you, has any changes been made that we should be aware of? Not that, uh, nothing that comes to mind, Barbara, the, the design of the facilities has not changed. Okay. Um, we did experience one obstacle in the ground. Um, it's an FPL duck bank and, um, so not all of the piles for the east expansion have been installed because we delayed the project to get that duck bank moved rather than redesigning the structure. Um, and we might've been able to redesign it quicker, but it made more sense to stick with the original design. Uh, so everything that I've shared with you to date um, is still holes. And so we're at what, 30 feet, it's been so long. So it's uh, 30 stories. 32 stories? Um, 29 um, stories. Um, the, there, there will be a rooftop um, lounge on the 29th floor. So that will be the only thing up there. Barbara, can I add to that? Um, okay. You and know that we've always so been, Bob, can I add? Yeah. Can I, can okay. I go? Yeah. No. You know, you, you finish up, Barbara. No, because I, I don't recall a rooftop lounge. That was something that we had concerns about the noise from. And, and we made the lounge all interior. Um, so it doesn't have removable windows or anything like that. Okay, so it's inside a, a lounge. Okay. Correct. Okay. okay. Correct. There's, I should tell you, there's, there's a balcony next to it um, uh, above all the other balconies um, that are on that side of the building. Um, uh, but that's, that's the only uh, outside activity. Okay, Barbara, you bring up a very, very good point. And, 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 oh, and let me clarify, we're, we're not, we, we don't intend on having tables or anything out there. That's just for people to go out and get fresh air. And if, there, if, if it ends up being a noise issue, that's something that we'll have to operationally take care of and you know, um, make sure that okay. people are not being a nuisance to you all. Okay. Okay, Barbara. Yeah. You you know Joanne Robinson from Harbor sure. Inlet, right? Sure. She and I have been working with Alan pre-COVID on some um, agreement or understanding that we may trying to memorialize somehow as to the uh, hours of operation for outdoor music, and this is this is going to be important vis-a-vis -vis the discussion of the uh, plaza. So let's give Alan an opportunity to talk about the plaza and then we can continue this discussion about the operational issues of what goes on in that plaza vis-a-vis -vis noise and things like that. So we're getting on to eight o'clock and I'd like to give Alan an opportunity to finish his presentation. So Alan, you wanna continue? I don't see any more hands up. Okay, um, I was just looking at um, the noise ordinance and um, well, I, I, I can't find the exact thing. So let, let me 
All right, um, Marilyn, can I share now? Or do I, oh, I, I, I press share screen. Okay, I think that's what I need to do. Um, Ellen, you're a co-host, so you can share if you want. Okay, great. Um, allow Zoom to share your screen. Um, And it's not letting me do maybe, it. Wait, Alan, maybe I have to make you a host as opposed to a co-host. Hang on just a second. Let me make you a host and that will certainly help. I'm a host now. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's see if that works. It is not working. So Marilyn, I'm going to email you the slide. Okay. And then you can put it up. Uh, so just bear with me a second. I apologize, everyone. Um, okay, forward to... Marilyn, can I get your email address, please? Uh, President HCA at Comcast.net. President HCA at Comcast.net. And is the president capitalized? Nope. Okay. Come on. It changed it from president to resident. <laughs> All right, give me a second. I um, really thought I'd just be able to share this on my screen. Comcast dot, what did you say, net? Net. All right. Um, okay, it's on its way to you now. Okay, and what you need to do, Alan, is you need to go onto the participant list and make me the host again. Okay, um, and where do I, oh, participant list, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, and click on my need... name on more and you can make me the host again. Look at that, make host. Yep, the slide just arrived. Great, there you go, you're the host. Okay. Here we go, the slide is here. Now just give me a minute and I will get the slide. Site plan down here, done. I'm back to the host. Oh Lord, what did we used to do beforehand? No. Yeah, okay, here we go. Share my screen. And down here is the slide. <sighs> Come on, darling, open up. Well, it's no, here. That's it. But double click on it again. Um, oh, there you go. Just takes oh, it's time. It's opening. Okay. Right? Marilyn, okay. go to go to uh, slideshow. Okay. And slideshow. And, and click on that, and then go play from start. Got it. And that will enlarge it. There you go. Whoa, oh, I'm sorry. What did I do? You must have clicked on something to exit. So um, on exit, click, click to exit again. And then um, oh, you should rats. have an escape. escape there, it is. But there you go. Okay. So try again. Go just lightly click once on play from start. Okay. Play from start. Okay. You got it. There you go. Okay. I'm not even going to touch it. I'm going to leave it right there. <clears throat> Beautiful. All right. So <laughs> this is the um, most recent uh, site plan that I have. It's not completely accurate to, to, to Barbara's uh, point. 
there's only one change on this, and that is um, the restaurant that's furthest east will be orient oriented the same as the other two restaurants. It's not going to be uh, facing uh, directly towards uh, the water the way it is right now. Other than that, this is essentially the design that we've been looking at. Um, and <clears throat> um, I was asked to kind of talk to you through a little more of what we're doing with the plaza. Um, so I'll start on the left and go to the right. Um, so the top left, uh, it says sailfish fountain. <clears throat> no, no, that's where you are with your cursor, Marilyn, yeah. is the hotel area. Right, so we're going here, halfway, sailfish halfway fountain, across, right here. Right there. Sailfish fountain. There you go. So that's, that's really the official beginning of the plaza area. Okay, and so that's the same sailfish fountain that was in front of the convention center. We're moving it out closer to the road. So um, folks either driving in or driving by on 17th Street will be able to get a good view of the fountain. So it'll be much more visibly accessible to the general public. Um, immediately below that, you see kind of a wide undulating area. That is hardscape. Um, exactly, that area. So that's meant uh, to serve different purposes. One is just for people to walk along. Uh, and um, another is we, we put hardscape here so that we could host um, like a, a local festival or something like that. If, if the neighborhood association or the city wanted to do something, they could put those 10 by 10 tents on either side of that walkway and still have adequate room in between for the public uh, to walk through. Um, so uh, sort of a multifunctional space there. Uh, below that on the bottom, it says pop jet fountain in island. And then below that it says event drop off. Now the event drop off, I wanna point out, Marilyn, if you could go for, the, for that little event drop off roadway or stop, um, actually right where you were, uh, the end of that, yep, keep going to the end, right there. That and the other entrance uh, um, are gonna be blocked off. Oh, shoot. It's, it's gonna, I, but I, I can keep talking about it. Yeah, People keep saw. talking, keep talking, I'm sorry. Okay, that road is gonna be blocked off the vast majority of the time by, um, we're gonna have um, uh, movable planter stands there. Um, so we want to maintain the pedestrian uh, aspect of this plaza. The only time really that we're probably going to need to um, uh, have folks drive up there is when we have local events that are utilizing the ballroom in this facility. Um, and and uh, then we would need to provide for more cars coming onto the site. Let's say, um, uh, I don't know, the um, United Way decides that they wanna do the mayor's gala dinner um, in this ballroom here, okay? People would be able to, um, local folks would be able to drop off their folks there um, in front of the facility uh, and then they'd be able to drive um, back to the other end. And then importantly here, make a, they could, they, they make a right. And then there's that loop underneath where it says vendor showcase, which loops them back going in the other direction. So Marilyn, if you could put that, that road that you're on right now, there, go up please to the top. Stop right there, please, okay. Those two drives are inbound only. So they're one way south. And we specifically did that at your behest to not only, uh, to not only limit, but even reduce the amount of traffic coming off of our site that goes underneath the causeway and onto Grande. Um, so right now that's allowed, it's been allowed. Uh, we are gonna be prohibiting it because all traffic that comes onto the site will be forced to exit out 20th Street. Um, and one of the ways we're accomplishing that is by um, making that, part, that stretch of the road one way, right where Maryland is now, 
that is um, um, actually that's one way also the two way the two way is there stop that's two way and then um, technically then it splits you can either go to the right to the event drop off or if you go up Maryland to that loop all right that's that's for cars and then if you go back to that beginning point right there where you are that we that particular loop we designed for buses and we we're going to have buses also come in on 20th street come up this drive take that loop and that's why that loop is as big as it is to accommodate buses and then the bus would pull up in front of the convention center and disgorge their passengers and as you know when when they're facing south the door will be right next to the sidewalk um so that, that's how that whole roadway network is designed there. So the event drop-off road is for specific events only, otherwise that's closed. And then um, most of the road up top is one way. Um, so now um, uh, the, aside from these, that event drop-off road and that hardscape kind of promenade area that I showed you, um, most of everything else is softscape. Um, there are some pathways that will run through it. Well, actually, I, I apologize. Where Maryland is right now, that is also hardscape. So you all are familiar. Look at the top there where Maryland just was. Stop. Go, go up. And it says promenade connection to the right there. Oh. Right there. Right there. So we're talking about connecting to the promenade that runs adjacent to the Hilton property. And there's a, a lovely promenade there. We intend on extending that and, and, and uh, putting in a nicer version of it on our property. And you'll be able to walk all the way from the canal on the Hilton property down to our property. Um, if you go down and stop at the point there, you'll see that now there's a little dock, actually, that also, Barbara, is changing. <clears throat> We're not gonna have a dock like that. We're gonna have a dock that is running parallel to that seawall, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the promenade will go down, and then you turn, and it continues walking along the waterway uh, until you hit the bottom of where, right there, stop. And, and that line there is the beginning of the port security zone for uh, birth two and terminal two. Um, the ships will not extend that far, the ships, um, but we had to allow for about 100 feet on either side of the ships uh, to be able to accommodate um, how they moor. Um, if, if you're familiar with that area at all, you'll know that there are some large ballards there that the ships use to uh, tie down uh, when they're uh, anchored um, at, at shore. <clears throat> so um, other than, so that's all hardscape. Um, those little, um, those two rows are representative of small trees on the promenade. Um, and so we're trying to have a, a shaded walkway along most of the promenade. Now, right where you are, that seawall there, I told you that we're gonna have one dock that runs parallel to that, right where, right there, Maryland, if you stop there, okay, that area is where the water taxi is gonna be operating from. So instead of operating underneath the causeway, we're moving them to that, um, that southern point of that promenade or the, the, the tip, so to speak, right there. Um, so that will make, um, so instead of getting off the water taxi underneath uh, the causeway and not really having a sense of where you are and where you're going, you're now gonna be able to get out in visual access, with visual access of both the convention center and the hotel. So it will make traversing that area more secure and comfortable. Uh, immediately um, north of that, the rest of the dock will be used for transient char charter vessels only. So we are not allowing any sort of permanent dockage. And the only dockage that we're allowing here is for charter vessels that are hired by either the hotel or the convention center to support uh, a group staying uh, or using one of those two 
facilities. So we might have a daytime conference and then they wanna do a dinner cruise uh, as an option for some of their guests. The, the dinner boat would pull up there, people would get on, it would take off. Um, the idea is to uh, keep that um, view shed open. Uh, that was not only a priority for us, but a very clear priority for the city of Fort Lauderdale to maintain a clear view shed from Eisenhower all the way out to the water. And so we've done the best that we can uh, regarding uh, doing that. So we, we, we don't want large boats there on a regular basis. Um, so Marilyn, if you can go back to the left, then um, I, I'll cover that area last because I know we're gonna have questions about that area. Um, so you can see a garden area, a restaurant area. There's a lot of vegetation in here um, and we'll have um, some, what I'll say, quote, um, quote unquote, lawn space yet to be determined whether or not it's gonna be real grass or artificial. Um, uh, but we're gonna have a lot of shrubbery, a lot of trees. There will be some designated pathways um, in here. Um, you, you can't really see clearly, but we have some, uh, because of the elevation changes within this area, uh, we have a number of ramps uh, for ADA compliance uh, to make sure that folks can uh, traverse the area to get where they need to go. So the promenade area that we talked about all the way along the water, that's gonna be at the same level that it is now. And then from there, stop right there, please. That, that, that hardscape walkway, it go up a little to the walkway, uh, if you would, Marilyn. I gotta find my uh, cursor, hang on. Okay. So yeah. yeah, right there, that walkway right there uh, is gonna ramp up to the elevated area of the plaza. And it, but it, it, the ramping has to follow ADA guidelines. So there's a certain rise and run that's allowable, meaning for every foot forward, you can only go up, um, I think it's an inch or, or something along those lines. I, I Don't quote me on that. I'm just trying to give you an example of what rise and run means. Okay, so, Alan, can we move on to the performance area? Because I've yes, got hands Marilyn. up. Yes, Marilyn. I got hands okay. up already. Okay, let's do so that. The, the performance area, there's a small stage. We specifically have it facing away from um, uh, residential areas. Um, we have um, met with Marilyn and other representatives. We've committed that this is uh, for, uh, for, for when we have music, it's acoustic music only that we're not gonna have amplified music on, um, on this site. We might, um, we might have a, um, a microphone for a speaker. Um, you, you, know, you, you, you could do um, a workshop event or something on that facility if a, a conference organizer wanted to do something different. Uh, but um, by and large, um, the only um, amplified music that will be allowed in this area will be music that is inside a tent. So that performance area is actually a lawn space uh, and we're gonna be installing anchor points there so that we can accommodate a large tent there. Um, could be for uh, a cocktail hour or it could be for a wedding and um, only then would uh, music be allowed within the tent. Um, but uh, when that is open and there is activity on the, uh, what we'll call the stage, uh, that would be acoustic only. Um, so uh, with that, um, Marilyn, let's open it up to questions. Okay, uh, play from start. And I have uh, the first hand up I have, well now I, I can't see the hands. Oh, I, I'm uh, Scott, I have Scott, Scott. Marilyn. Yes. Alan. Hey. Alan, um, a long time, I'm a long time resident of Harbordale, uh, now moving here permanently in retirement. Um, and I'm very excited about uh, everything that's happening over at, at the port and with the convention center. 
And what you'll find is I, I'm a big fan of kind of keeping the area as much as possible to its historic um, view shed as, as, as it was 100 years ago. Hopefully what you're doing here is gonna last 100 years into the future uh, if we don't get flooded out, of course. I see in your, your notes here that um, you're, you're lining the promenade with a double row of sable palms. Thrilled to see that the state tree, the sable palm, is your choice there. Um, it's, but it's very important, I believe, that everything that's done as far as landscaping and vegetation in the plan here is native to Florida. I mean, it's, it's what you would have seen. I think it's important if you got off a boat 100 years ago, you've probably seen some of the historical societies of the pictures of Las Olas Boulevard with the incredible trees and mangroves growing over it. Are you guys planning to have a native landscape? Are you thinking about that? Are you thinking about pollinators and bees and other things that are native to Florida so that we can really incorporate this project for a long time in, into what was, has been here for forever? Okay, um, and um, so it's Scott? Yes. Okay, Scott, um, I, I can probably get a little more information for you than what I'm about to share. And, and, and I will tell you that the design for the plaza and the, and the final details of it um, is the last thing that we have to work on. We're at, um, you know, we were at 90% drawings for all of the structures and we submitted for permits on those but we're only at 50% for the plaza. So it's not completely worked out and um, your, your input um, will be helpful in that regards. Uh, I know that we are looking uh, specifically at native vegetation um, for um, resiliency purposes uh, because we'd like to minimize irrigation on the site and just rely on natural rainfall. And so perfect, re perfect reason to do that. There you exactly. go. Seriously. Okay, because we, as part of our commitment to sustainability, we want to reduce irrigation in general. Um, and 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 one of the things that I tried to get incorporated in, and frankly, I can't remember if we did or not, is I tried to get rainfall capture from the new structures that we could feed over to the fountain rather than using uh, municipal water for that. Um, uh, and, and that would require, of course, a cistern underneath it to store it. Um, and I can't remember where we ended up on that budget wise, but I know that's something I, I tried to get in, but we are gonna use native vegetation. I also specifically where we've emphasized to the design team, wherever we have a specific view shed issue, we leaned towards um, uh, palms rather than um, deciduous trees. Uh, the deciduous trees have much larger um, heads. Um, they create much more of a, a view shed obstacle, as beautiful as they are. Um, uh, and, uh, and they're appropriate for some isolated spots on uh, the plaza. But in general, we've tried to stay away from those larger trees to the, the, the types of palms that will pose less of a visual obstacle for folks, both on the site and off the site, um, that uh, want to look around and, and, and enjoy the water and everything else. Um, that's about all I have in response to what you asked. Do you have okay. a follow -up? I appreciate that. And it's good to hear that there's still time for input into this. Just to let you know, there are dozens of deciduous trees native to Florida that don't get very big. Uh, they could be a choice. There are some palms. Um, you know, there's a hundred potential palms that you could put in. Maybe ten of them might be native, and it's very important. You know, I believe to pick the native ones for that. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, Scott, for Scott, can I add to this? Can I uh, tell Alan? Um, yes. We we are the um, experts in native planting and um, um, uh, butterfly gardens. We just won the Emerald Award from Broward County for our native um, uh, gardens on Southeast 10th Avenue. 
So if you ever need a partner to talk to about looking over this, um, um, your plant, uh, plant list, call on us because we've got great experience in it and we're actually winners in that, uh, in that regard. So uh, I wanna pick this up a little bit. Uh, Steve, do you have something uh, you wanna add here? Uh, yes, Marilyn. Uh, Alan, you and your team, I think, have done a superb job in thinking through uh, this entire project. Uh, in the area where the water taxi is going to be um, and, and the uh, other uh, interim vessels that you described, you also said something about keeping the view open. Uh, would that include uh, keeping the view open all the way across to where the super yacht village is so that we don't have any iconic uh, tall buildings? No. I'm, I'm not, I, are you talking about on our site? No, across the water. Maryland we have what I'm talking about and so does some oh, others. Okay, we have no control over that project. Steve. Okay, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, I, I, I understand where you're going. I sat in on that last presentation as well. Okay. Um, it, okay. It, was star it was startling to say the least. Yes. All right. Well, well, we'll deal with that. Barbara, you're next. Okay. Uh, so this looks lovely. Um, is this open to the public where you're having the promenade connections? The entire plaza is open to the public. So people are going to be able to go over there and fish off the sides there? No, we're not going to allow fishing, no. Okay. And then are you guys going to add a breakwater at some point? You're, I don't know if you've ever stood there, but that's some rough water. There's boats constantly going by. That could be so tricky, um, getting people on and off charter boats. I mean, even the water taxi is a little hairy, but they're back behind the bridge. Putting it out there is you're exposing the boats to um, lots of wave action. We, we are aware of that. And um, uh, the, the gentleman who owns the water taxi was not concerned about that. He felt that um, we could um, compensate for that. Um, uh, that's in part, uh, I think due to the flexibility of the dock itself. Uh, so it's not going to be uh, fixed in place and will allow for a little movement to um, adjust for that type of energy um, uh, that, that's coming in, but it's not going to, you know, go up and down a lot. Um, okay, so you're uh, actually going to have actual docks across that area. One dock that, that runs the length of that wall. Okay. Okay. Karen, uh, uh, Michelle, Robert. Hi. Uh, three questions. The first one, I noticed that you say in that promenade area, the, it's a lower seating area. Does that mean in the um, performance area, the seats are going to be almost like an amphitheater down lower? No, no. So when I said lower, I didn't, I didn't say lower seating area. It's just a lower that the promenade will be at the same level that the, the current seawall is at. We're not raising the promenade. Okay, so it's, it's at the current level that I see out my window right now. Correct. Mm -hmm. So for performances, are you just gonna have permanent bleachers sitting there? How are you gonna no, do? No, no, we, we have no intent to put any type of seating in there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would just be people sitting on the grass. Okay. Uh, second question regarding the restaurants. Any requirement about outdoor music at the restaurants? Um, so that's something we've made clear uh, and actually I believe put into our hotel management agreement regarding adherence to um, uh, noise ordinances and, and sensitivity to um, uh, local noise concerns. Um, and then the third restaurant is going to be managed by the convention center. So Mar Marilyn, if you could go over to the, um, where it says restaurants. Right there. All right. So what you're looking at is actually two restaurants that have mm -hmm. a shared kitchen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, one uh, will most likely be steakhouse-ish. 
Um, and then the other one is going to be sort of a schizophrenic uh, gourmet burger vegan place. Uh, <laughs> schizophrenic. <laughs> so anyhow, both of those are going to be run by the hotel, um, which is why, you know, a shared kitchen is more than viable uh, for them. And then the, the, to the right of that, there's a structure that is currently on this drawing right there. So that's the one that's also going to be turned in an angle similar to the other two. That mm -hmm. one will be um, most likely run by uh, a local independent. Uh, and um, that facility will be managed by the convention center. So uh, that's run by SMG or ASM Global, as are now known. Both they and Omni have been made keenly aware of our concerns about noise. Um, the, so there's not going to be any amplified music from the restaurants either. No, no, there's there's not supposed to be. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll point out to you though is go out in your balcony after the meeting, and um, yeah. you'll see that that Grande Drive disappears from view um, as it continues eastward because of the increase in elevation of the causeway. Mm -hmm. um, the restaurants are going to be situated east of that um, at a point that um, even if people are just out there talking, you shouldn't hear it because the causeway should be deflecting that. And my, and my final question has to do with the area over to the left, left of Vendor Showcase on the other side of that road. You see it looks like a semicircle and it has like little round circle, that area. Is that the pool deck? What no, is that? that is actually the um, uh, the indoor outdoor twenty four seven uh, restaurant for the hotel. So that's where they're going to be serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be an indoor dining room, and they're also going to have outdoor seating as well. Okay, okay. And, 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 what, and just one one final question, Marilyn. I'm sorry. Yeah, How no. actually is but, the amenity? Uh, but wait, wait, Michelle. I want to point out that. What? That is going to be covered by um, several stories higher than that, the pool deck. And that was my last question. How high actually is that pool deck in feet off the ground? Not stories, feet. Um, Marilyn, can you add, add that question to the list? Okay, I thank want, you. I want to say it's somewhere between, I, I think somewhere between 80 and 90, but don't quote me on it. Let me go look and, and come back to you with it. Okay, thank you. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're okay, um, these were all excellent, excellent questions. And, and we know we have had a very good relationship with Alan, uh, but these are the types of issues, um, the noise issues especially, that I think we have to have a little more, how shall I say, uh, comfort in than just these conversations we're having with Alan. So Joanne Robinson and I have been talking about trying to put together a, um, a sort of a memorandum of understanding, if you want to mention that, say, say that, that uh, codifies or, or, or commemorates some of these commitments that there will be no um, amplified music in the performance area other than inside a tent. And that, for instance, these restaurants, restaurant, 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 they will um, not only abide by the city's noise codes, which we all know are notoriously porous, but they will additionally also stop outdoor music at a, a, a time certain. Um, when we were negotiating the Pier 66 South project, we, uh, the developer agreed to limit outdoor music to the hour, to specific hours during the weekend, uh, slightly longer hours during the weekend. And I think it's important that despite this wonderful relationship we have, Alan's going to be, you know, elected county commissioner and uh, he's going to leave this position. And uh, we need to have some more memorialized uh, the, um, assurances about these noise issues. So this was a wonderful opportunity for us to sort of identify the areas that we're going to be concerned with. And I just want to add one more thing to Alan. On top of the pool deck, Will there also be restaurants that will be uh, we will need to be concerned with in terms of noise because that will really be a problem. They're high up. So there's going to be a um, 
a, a grill um, to serve the folks that are utilizing the pool deck. It's, so it's not formal dining. Uh, it's gonna be walk up. Um, there might be a few tables out there, but primarily it's to serve folks that are in their chase lounges. Okay, but I will, I will point out to you that we have several um, of these types of facilities in downtown Fort Lauderdale, these rooftop sort of grills, and uh, they hold parties and they blast music. So the nature of the dining is not so much what concerns us, it's that the operators agree that there will be no amplified music past a certain hour in the outdoors. So we're gonna be working on that. People, Michelle, I hope I can count on you and Barbara to, uh, to join us, uh, me and Joanne in working on this because now that we're getting, you know, we're getting, this is gonna happen. It's gonna be two, three years from now. So now's the time to make these arrangements so that we don't get, you know, panicked at the, at the last minute to try and work these things out. So this has been absolutely terrific. Alan, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let go of this screen sharing. Okay, okay. I'm gonna stop. All right, we're gonna come back. Um, does anybody else have questions? I have, let me see there, two, only two hands. And so nobody else has any questions. Okay, excellent. So if nobody has any more questions for Alan, as I say, this is our- No, 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 hold on, hold on. I, mean, no, I, I see Barbara and Scott have their hands up. No, I think they've spoken already. No. Uh, but then can, can I ask one more quick question? Sure, 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 sure. Um, so the, the CBV, are they gonna have a welcome center in there? The, they, the original um, intent was that they would have a uh, welcome center to support pedestrian traffic. Um, there's a, um, there is gonna be, I don't know, maybe three or four parking spaces there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. The majority of staff is going to park in the garage, um, uh, but it, it's not it's not designed for a lot of folks to be coming in and out by vehicle. But it's definitely it. Um, we intended it to be very supportive of the pedestrian activity in the area. Okay. Okay. And Alan, I just have one last question. Um, I noticed on the um, I think it was a city commission agenda or one of the agendas that the, um, there was money set aside for a study to begin studying the um, use of the, uh, the, or the installation of a monorail from the airport to the convention center and the port. This is like planning money and this is like long, long-term issues. Can you comment on that at all? Uh, yeah, I can give you just some basic information on it that um, you know, is pretty much public already. Um, the, the county, uh, when it um, floated the, um, the surtax referendum, specifically included in that um, uh, a light rail initiative. So the, the county wants to um, create some light rail opportunities, um, both north, south, and very importantly, east, west. Uh, we do a pretty good job of moving folks north, south, but the only effective east-west that we have is 595. Um, so um, the, um, the idea is to tie in the airport to the seaport, the convention center, downtown, going all the way out to the arena, to the um, educational complex in Davie, um, to other uh, high traffic uh, locations that would warrant having that type of transportation available. Um, so um, the county had for many years intended to make the first leg, the airport seaport convention center leg. Then there was a reshuffling of priorities for uh, a number of reasons. And right now the county is working with the state um, uh, FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation, the, the region, uh, the, the regional office, uh, we're looking at an east-west east rail line uh, running um, along uh, Broward Boulevard. And that's, um, and that's to come into, cross the railroad tracks and come into the downtown. And then the idea is to eventually connect that to um, what I presume would be the second leg, which would be the 
airport seaport convention center leg. Um, we recently signed and approved at a board meeting a, um, uh, a memorandum of understanding with FDOT to build a new intermodal center at, uh, at just outside of the airport. Um, good job there, Solomon. My son just snuck back, uh, snuck uh, by me, uh, so he wasn't on camera. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, um, so uh, when you drive to the airport uh, from where you guys are, you you go around an interminably long loop. Um, we call that the donut. And in the middle of the donut, there's uh, you know a decent sized track of land. That's where the intermodal center is supposed to go. Um, what we're gonna be doing on airport property is installing a new people mover like you've seen in a lot of other airports that will connect all the terminals so that if you need to go from one to the other, you don't have to walk or run you'll be able to get on this uh, um, people mover uh, to go from one terminal to another. And that people mover will also take you out to the new intermodal center. The intermodal center will, also, will house, um, uh, importantly, a ton of new parking. Very importantly, all of the rental car operations. So those will be moved from where they are in the middle of the airport right now out to the intermodal and that will free up more parking for you and I close to where we need to go to catch our flights. Um, so the people mover will take you out to that facility where you can get your rental car or pick up your car that's parked there or make a connection to the next leg um, which is yet to be determined if it's going to be the same mode. Um, there's, a, there's been discussions for years about whether or not you use rubber tire, like down in Miami, they have that people mover, uh, or you use uh, something more akin to truly a light rail. Um, and there are strong preferences on both sides. Um, that would go from that intermodal center um, right into uh, Midport, uh, where six of our eight terminals are, and then from Midport turn, and then come up Eisenhower to Northport, where there are two more cruise terminals and uh, the convention center uh, with the new hotel. Um, a possible a leg in the future could be connecting that to downtown. Um, we've already had discussions with the city, acknowledging that if we did that, it would most likely have to be elevated. Um, so that we weren't um, uh, taking away from roadway capacity. Um, that is way far in the future. Uh, it's not a project that I'm directly working on, uh, but um, I think I've shared with you about all that I know, and like I said, is already in the public record. It's just in bits and pieces. Okay, appreciate that. Appreciate that update. And uh, again, like you say, it's all in the future, but it's good to know somebody's thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I want to thank you very much on behalf of the uh, 30 people who started the meeting uh, for your uh, for your participation tonight. And I have my list of questions that I will send to you. Um, and um, hopefully we won't wait another year to talk with you. Hopefully we'll have a, another opportunity to take a look at that bypass road um, as, as the design drawings get uh, closer and closer to reality. And please, once you really get down to working on the um, design of the open space, check in with us. We can really provide you with some good input in terms of the, the native plants and, and, and ways to make the, um, the area really accessible and usable for the neighbors as well as the, the people who go to the convention center. Again, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to let you go home now, and we're going to continue with our meeting. So okay. everybody, thank, thank, thank for Alan. And then Marilyn, yes, I look sir. forward to getting an email from you tonight or tomorrow with my to-do list. Yes, you sir. Yes, you certainly will, sir. Thank you okay. very much. All right. Thank you all. Take care. All right. Good night. Thank okay. you. All right. Let's get back to our agenda. We're going to go very, very quickly through this uh, so that we don't keep everybody much, much longer. Um, an update on the meeting space. Okay, let me give you a very quickie on that. 
Um, Scott and I met with Captain Stutters uh, at the, um, uh, the police substation in Harbor Shops, which they have offered to give us uh, rent free for holding our meetings. Um, it's, a, it's a good space. Uh, it's got a dirty rug, but other than that, it's a, it's a really good space. It's got um, Wi-Fi and the ability for us to do hybrid meetings there. So we're gonna be working on that to see uh, if we can't use it as a spot to continue or to, to resume in-person meetings and hopefully hybrid meetings. Um, that's the update on that. Uh, first quarter membership report, we're doing really well. One of our new members is the uh, owner of the barbershop on, uh, on Cordova Road. He joined uh, last week. Um, update on Guy Harvey. I'm gonna let Cindy do this and I'm gonna put up something on the screen that is just, just beautiful. Cindy, are you still with us? I don't know if Cindy's still with us. Yes, there she, I gotta unmute I, uh, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go. Um, well, it looks like the Guy Harvey project is uh, moving along. Um, they have some paperwork and permitting and that sort of thing. But um, according to Karen, it looks like that will be underway through the fall and maybe by mid fall or, or so we're looking to have the project completed. So we're very excited. The, 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 they really did a beautiful job. And when the project is completed, we would like to hold um, like a little ceremony. Um, well, hopefully it won't be that little uh, and invite uh, Dr. Guy Harvey to join us and maybe speak a little bit about his, um, his wonderful effort in um, marine um, environmental uh, work and all the great things he does, as well as his wonderful art. So we're really looking forward to that. It'll be a nice way to celebrate this long, <laughs> long-term uh, project, but um, it seems like it's coming along nicely. Thank you. And uh, Cindy, we're also trying to work on a, um an event outdoors for our April, uh, for our May meeting. Cindy is yeah. working on a tree giveaway in the park, in the Harbordale Park. Uh, and we'd like to do that uh, as um, in, in lieu of the, um, the May meeting, we'd like to, to do an event in the park so we can invite people and we can get together and do our normal, you know, the networking and seeing each other and enjoying each other's company and couple that with a tree a tree giveaway. So we're working on that. Um, well, also, yeah. Marilyn, let's, yeah. let's promote this. Again, um, the tree giveaway is going to happen. Mark has everything, the 30th. Carol, if you're still with us, I'd like to remind you maybe to uh, reach out to Green Your Routine. Hopefully we can get some points for this. I think we have to apply two weeks before this type of event. And um, we were thinking, and again, we can discuss this, maybe to have a small meeting, like maybe start the uh, event at 10 o'clock and go from 10 to 10.30 for our Harbordale sort of get together meeting, but also membership drive, because hopefully there'll be people that aren't members um, coming, which is fine, but it, it's an opportunity for a membership drive as well. So um, it'll be first come first serve. We only get 50 trees. And at the time, we'll see if we have a lot of people, then we get one tree each. If not, we get two trees each or whatever, you know, and at the end, if there are leftovers, we have all those too. We can divide those up as we see fit. Okay. So that, that's, that's coming um, in uh, at the end of April, beginning of May. Um, and the last thing I wanted to bring up is there's good news and there's bad news. There's a little bit of bad news on the joint use park at Harbordale Elementary. You know, we've been trying to get Harbordale Elementary School playground opened up so that the residents can use it on the, uh, in the evenings and on the weekends and during the summer when the school doesn't use it. And we were part of the program, we were on the list, we were approved by all the advisory boards and then the city commission had to approve the whole program. And that did not happen. There was a spanner in the works at the city commission meeting at three o'clock in the morning. And they told the staff to go back and revisit the program and revisit all the participants in the program and the funding for the program. 
So we thought we would be able to give you good news that the park was gonna be open at least this summer for the use of, of the residents and that might not happen because the program's been delayed. We're not out of the program, we're fighting very hard to stay in the program, but this is a hiccup that we're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to work through. <clears throat> the other bad news, <clears throat> I hate to be the bearer of bad news tonight, the raised intersection project on Cordova and 15th Street. The, de the design was done, the drawings went out for bid, and unfortunately the bids came back three times more than what was um, allocated for them. We had about $110,000 to do the project and the bids came in at 300,000, give or take. So the city staff is working on what they call value engineering, trying to find ways to reduce the cost of the project. Maybe we don't do stamped asphalt like the other two, maybe we do colored cement. Uh, they're also looking for other sources of funds to augment the project, maybe they can find some uh, city funding for sidewalks and use that for the sidewalk portion and, and use just the $110,000 for the, uh, the raised intersection. They're working very hard to try and find a way to, to make the project happen. So there's bad news in that this is a setback, but there's good news in that the city staff is trying very hard to find workarounds so that the project can go forward. So good news, bad news. All right, I have nothing else on the agenda. It's already almost nine o'clock. Is there anything anybody else wants to uh, have uh, to talk about before we uh, adjourn? And I see no hands. I see nobody with any, uh... this was a good meeting. We got a lot of information from Alan. He's always very, very helpful and very informative, but we got to, we got to keep on them, especially about this noise issue because assurances from Alan are great, but we need them in a little more like in writing. We need them in writing with somebody of authority sign signature so that we don't end up um, thinking that we're, we've got the problem solved and we don't. So with that, I'm going to uh, say good night to everybody. I'm gonna stop sharing and say good night to everybody. Um, good night. See good you night. next time. Good night. Great meeting. Yeah. Bye-bye, Thank you very everybody. much. Thank Have you. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye.